I'm Craig Lamolt. Tonight on Greater Boston, where did the phrase Underground Railroad come from? The answer lay in the archives of the Boston Public Library. I'll speak with a researcher and writer behind the discovery to discuss the untold story of black activist Thomas Smallwood. Then, a look at the Ig Nobel Prizes, that's Ig Nobel, which honor quirky, unique, some might say strange research. I'll talk to the founder and one of this year's winners who sought to answer the question of do each of your nostrils have the same amount of nose hairs? Tucked away in the Boston Public Library, amongst a stack of other decades-old newspapers, lay a new answer to an old historical question. How did the Underground Railroad get its name? Former New York Times reporter Scott Shane found it while digging through the archives for his new book about abolitionist and writer Thomas Smallwood, called Flee North, A Forgotten Hero and the Fight for Freedom in Slavery's Borderland. To dig into what he learned, Scott Shane joins me now, as does Lamurchi Frazier, an artist, educator, historian, and the former director of education and interpretation at the Museum of African American History. Thank you both so much for joining us. You're welcome. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting us. Yes. So, Scott, can we start with you? Can you set the scene for us about this warehouse at the Boston Public Library? You're digging through, looking for records. What did you find? So, actually, this was all during the pandemic in 2020. Uh, and the Boston Public Library was shut down. Uh, I started contacting people there. And eventually, they, uh, they reported to me that they'd found these newspapers in a warehouse and were thinking about doing something with them. And then after several months of back and forth, they, I got word that they had microfilmed the whole collection, the whole stack. And I went down to the library and downloaded them all on a thumb drive and, and uh, read them very carefully. And so Thomas Smallwood was born in slavery outside Washington, D.C. He basically educated himself. He bought his freedom and he started organizing mass escapes in the 1840s from slavery. And not only that, but he was sending off these newspaper dispatches to an abolitionist paper in Albany, New York. And it was in those newspaper dispatches that I discovered this story about how the Underground Railroad got its name. So it was an article from August 10th, 1842, right, in, in the publication, The Toxin of Liberty. And, and he said, it was your cruelty to him that made him disappear by the same underground railroad or steam balloon about which one of your city constables was swearing so bitterly a few weeks ago. Is that the first ever reference to this as the underground railroad? Yes, as far as I can tell, that's the first reference in print. You know, there are these big uh, 19th century newspaper databases now. Everything's been digitized. And if you go and put that phrase, Underground Railroad, into these databases, all of the early references come from Thomas Smallwood. At first, he's just quoting a police constable who is expressing his frustration. Uh, you know, all these people were escaping, and this police constable earned a lot of money on the side from, the, the, from catching runaways and returning them and collecting the money, the rewards, he was saying they must be getting away on an Underground Railroad. Of course, there was no Underground Railroad in the 1840s. So he was essentially saying they must be kidnapped by aliens. I don't know how they're getting away. And Smallwood thought this was great. This was a compliment to him. And he started riffing on these newspaper dispatches, which he wrote under a pseudonym because everything he was doing was, of course, very risky and highly illegal. And he, he said he, he pronounced himself the general agent of all the branches of the Underground Railroad. He would, uh, with mock sympathy, advise slaveholders to report to the office of the Underground Railroad in Washington for further information about where their servants may, may have fled. And uh, so he had a grand time. And as it turns out, over the next year or two, other newspapers began to pick up that language, and that's why we call the whole uh, system of organized escapes the Underground Railroad today. I never appreciated before that the term Undergra Underground Railroad essentially started as a joke at slaveholders' expense. Yes, and, and sort of a, um, a joke with an edge. I mean, he, these, uh, these dispatches, which he wrote under a pseudonym he took from Charles Dickens, 
are written in a kind of high satirical style, and their purpose is basically to mock the slaveholders, mock the slave catchers, and celebrate the people who are who are making their escape. And so for him, the idea of this mythical system that, that is somehow transporting people to the north uh, was just a, a great big joke on the slave society. And Lamerci, here in Boston, particularly in Beacon Hill, I think, right, we have a, a, a rich history of the Underground Railroad. Can you take us through what we have here locally that's sort of hiding in plain sight, this history that's all around us? I uh, want to highlight that it was Sue Bailey Thurman, who was an archivist from Los Angeles, who under the, um, under her, her living and residence here with her husband, Howard Bailey Thurman, as a historian, she began to recognize these places and spaces of real note and our um, treasures like the African Meeting House and the ABL Smith School. As she created this Negro Freedom Trail, she was giving onus to the sites along what would have been Underground Railroad activity. And when we talk about this Underground Railroad activity as we review what is now a registered trademark of the Museum of African American History in 14 cited sites, it is always expanding because history is not static. In looking at those sites that she cited, we find a network of people, places, events, of safekeeping, of the clandestine nature of what had to be a necessary uh, underneath the, uh, the everyday activity um, organization of people providing safety, providing the opportunity to rebuild their lives as they arrived here. But we also know that the people who were here in the Vigilance Committee and the abolitionists were in a network nationwide, were in a space of people who would be traveling north, people who would be traveling west, people who would be traveling south uh, as roots of this um, uh, hidden pathway as they were arcing out their, their freedom, beginning to understand the cost of liberty and by any means necessary, whether it was on the real railroad, whether it was in carriages, whether they were walking, that this is what is a reality of having to keep that information contained. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that there is the Industrial Revolution that is bringing forth the steam engine, the, the wheels that are turning, we get this real railroad that is sporadic in its layout. In Beacon Hill, we can talk about the places that are by the structure of Beacon Hill hidden away from the main roads. If you go into Beacon Hill, you will find that it was a perfect site for underground, what is called underground railroad activity because there were alleyways. It is structured so that you could protect people in spaces like a space named Holmes Alley right. that you cannot see from the main Joy Street or you couldn't see from uh, Anderson Street or Russell Street. That the way it is structured, it is now deemed as one of the most plentiful spaces of Underground Railroad activity because of its structure and the nature of how it is laid out than any other place in the country. Uh, Scott, you wrote in an op-ed in the New York Times that sort of the mythology that's been built around the Underground Railroad may be actually obscuring some of the reality of, of what happened that in fact a lot of those who escaped from slavery did so on their own without any, any help. Uh, can, can you speak about that, about sort of the, the mythology of the Underground Railroad compared to the reality of it? Well, one of the things I found in, in researching this book is that, you know, the Underground Railroad became over many decades a sort of a kinder, gentler way for white Americans and black Americans to talk about slavery. The very um, sometimes brutal uh, story of slavery because there were uh, white Americans and black Americans involved in helping people you know, free themselves. Um, I think most historians would say 
that most people, you know, ran north, ran to freedom without a lot of help, uh, and that many of the people, uh, most of the people who were creating these networks and helping people escape were actually African-American themselves, usually free African-American. Um, but I think, you know, over the decades, there was a sense, an increasing sense that somehow this was something that white people did for black people. And I think that historians have pretty much put that myth to rest. Um, in my research, I also deal with the domestic slave trade uh, in Baltimore and Washington, which is where Smallwood was helping people escape. And many of them were escaping for fear that they were about to be sold south, possibly to the deep south of the cotton plantations or the sugar plantations and torn away from their families. And that was often the, um, the fear that would drive people to mm -hmm. move, you know, to try and uh, run for it in the middle of the night. Uh, and one thing that strikes me is that we Americans know a whole lot more about the Underground Railroad, which includes the stories of some, uh, you know, good hearted white people and nothing um, about the domestic slave trade, which does not, alas, uh, have any heartwarming stories about white people. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating story. It's a fascinating subject and something we could talk about a whole lot longer. And I wish we had more time, um, but I'm so grateful to both of you for joining us to talk about this day. Scott Shane and Lamerci Frazier, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Schools in and around Boston don't have enough dorms for their students, and local officials believe it's one cause contributing to skyrocketing housing costs in the area. Liz Nieslaus explains how the lack of accommodations drives up rental prices and squeezes the overall rent supply for everyone. One reason it may be so hard to find an apartment in Boston, college students. I was really lucky I had two friends who were already living off campus, and they're like, hey, do you want to be our third roommate? 160,000 college and grad students go to school in Boston. 42% of them live off campus in rentals in Boston and surrounding areas. I was looking in Cambridge, Alston. The majority of students live in these four neighborhoods. The city says it puts significant pressure on those rental markets. Near Copley is really nice, but super expensive, so I couldn't live there. Uh, downtown, literally anywhere, basically. Greater Boston has more than 50 colleges and universities, and most of them don't have enough housing. We have a housing crisis. I think it's part of the institution's responsibility to provide housing for their students. If they don't provide on-campus housing, that pushes the stresses on the rental market. It forces a competition between families and uh, adults, working adults, who are trying to find housing. Definitely was a long, hard process competing with all the other people looking for apartments in such a housing apartment shortage right now. And students often have an advantage, their parents' money. It's not necessarily always, you know, the student themselves paying. So there can be some like deeper pockets behind a lot of these students. And they take up those multi-bedroom family-sized units because collectively they can pay higher rent. You know, they don't have to pay the whole boat. They only have to pay a third of the room. They put tremendous pressure, upward pressure on rents, which has essentially made the city unaffordable. Grad school enrollment in Boston is up more than 25% over the past decade. Only about 10% of those grad students live on campus. And in cities around Boston, some schools don't even offer graduate housing. Masters uh, students, they are not allowed to stay on campus, so we had to search for off campus. And if schools built more housing, experts say rents in popular student neighborhoods would stabilize or decline. It's very hard to find a neighborhood where you can put in a large-scale residence hall without getting tremendous resistance. Not in my backyard, NIMBY. But you're not alone, Greater Boston. Take it from this visiting student from Williamsburg, Virginia. We have to compete with the regular citizens that are either choosing to retire off campus or move back in for whatever reason, and they don't like the college students. So it's been pretty hard even as a college student from far away from here. 
For more on GBH's priced out series, head to WGBH.org. Next up, what happens when you try to bring a spider back to life? What's going on when you say a word so many times? It stops sounding like a word. Can a smart toilet identify you by your butt? Odds are those questions have never crossed your mind, but they have occurred to the winners of the 2023 Ig Nobel Prizes, awards that honor unusual, unique, and quirky scientific endeavors around the world. The Chemistry and Geology Prize is awarded to Jan Zalasowicz for explaining why many scientists like to lick rocks. Another question I didn't know I needed the answer to. Just like the query at the heart of this year's Medicine Prize winning research, do people have the same amount of nose hairs in each nostril? Joining me with the answer is Dr. Natasha Meshenkovska, one of the lead researchers on that study. She's also an associate professor of dermatology at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine, plus the founder and MC of the Ig Nobel Prizes, Mark Abrams. Thank you both so much for joining us. Nice to be here. So, Thank you. Mark, it's important to make clear you're not in any way making fun of this research, right? The goal is to honor this science that uh, I think, as you say, makes people laugh and then makes people think. This is a prize we've been giving out every year, 10 prizes every year since 1991. And there's only one criterion. It's that if you win a prize, you've done something that makes people laugh and then think. We don't care for our purposes, whether you've done something wonderful or terrible, important or trivial, but it's gotta be something that grabs people anywhere immediately. And the event usually happens in Harvard's Sander, Sanders Theater. Right. Uh, this year, you, you did it uh, uh, remotely, as you did in the last four years, right, because of the pandemic. Yeah, this COVID thing This uh, COVID thing some, is still uh, here. Some doing things. Okay, um, but uh, it was posted online last week. Can you tell us about some of this year's winners? Yes, well, Natasha will describe her own research. Um, we, uh, this is the most difficult thing you've asked me. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll rattle a couple off here, actually. You've got one. That's easy. Uh, We've had so many that <laughs> it's like walking into a big supermarket and being asked, what do you see? But there's a study in here about what happens uh, when people are, are staring at a building. How many passerby, passersby will stop and create a crowd, right? This is an experiment done in 1968 in New York City. They gathered a bunch of people at the bottom of a tall building in Times Square and had them look up. And then they watched to see how many of the crowd would stop. And they found out that something like 40% of the people walking by would stop and also look up. So actually, that's an interesting point, is that uh, it doesn't, the research doesn't have to have been done this year. This was an older study. No, it can be older. It doesn't okay. have to be research. It doesn't have to be science. We gave an Ig Nobel Prize to the person who created the plastic pink flamingo. As well you should have. Uh, Natasha, I want to ask you about yes. your research. Tell us about your study, your research that won an award this year. Well, see, I'm in an office somewhere in the state of Washington, Spokane, never been here. And my job today is actually to teach other doctors, dermatologists, how to grow hair. So I am one of the dermatologists that does a lot of hair research and, you know, tries to help people that have no hair. And there's a condition, uh, we don't want to call it a disease, called alopecia areata, where people can actually have zero hair in their nose. And their nose can drip a lot. And they may be prone to more respiratory infections. So when we were trying to figure out how to help patients, we were like, okay, what do we know about nose hairs? Are they in the front? On the top, do we have 20? Do we have 200? So we flipped through all the textbooks and there was really nothing, nothing. Like, you know, those fancy gray anatomies, or at least we couldn't find anything. So we're like, well, let's go and figure this out ourselves. So we teamed up with the anatomy docs and we went to cadavers and we respectfully so um, teased out, plucked out and studied noses with a good team of medical students who were excited, excited. And they're all dermatologists now. So we had a problem and we solved it in a way. It may be funny to the world, but to us, it was something that really helped us figure out how to then now assess our patients and treat them. Okay, so you didn't uh, count cadaver nose hairs yourself. You had medical students do that for you and they were Yeah, okay. we all did it together, yeah. But okay. they, were, they honestly, they pushed me out of the way. They were so eager. They were like, mine. That's how some of the medical students are with procedures. They're like, get out of the way. We got this. So, so what's the big answer? Do we have the same number of nose hairs in our left and right nostrils? 
<laughs> almost, almost. Like interesting things came out of this. For example, people that have been on chemotherapy, they don't tend to have a lot of nose hair. So it was interesting to see the patient. I mean, people that had gone through certain types of systemic medications, it does affect you. So maybe we're understanding more because think about these silly things, but they are the guardians on the respiratory system. They're there for a reason. Even kids have them. So um, those are things that we picked into. And then our ENT colleagues did a huge study where they actually looked with live cameras and kind of continued our legacy. So we we had a funny idea that then sparked a whole nother big study in humans with a lot more doctors and a lot more fancy cameras. So that's who we were. That's funny good. or not, we delivered. All right, great, important. Right, it seems like this is the kind of award you couldn't set out to win, right? This is just something that has to kind of organically happen. You have pegged it. Anybody who tries to win one of these prizes will fail. This is a strange double quality that um, surprise is at the heart of it. So it's hard, maybe impossible, to design something that is so completely surprising that it'll make anyone laugh, but also lodge in their brain so all they want to do is tell their friends about it. That's a really hard combination to invent. Yeah. yeah. It, also, it seems to me that Many people may think of science as being dry, kind of straight ahead, like anything but funny. Um, and doing these awards, I'm, is, is there a sort of a, a hidden agenda or maybe not so hidden agenda of making science more accessible to people, making it clear that science, in fact, can be fun? Well, sure, science and everything else, anything that appears really dull might seem that way because you really don't know much about it. And if you talk to somebody who does it all the time, well, maybe you stumble upon a very dull person, but most people are much more interesting than you expect. And all it takes is one weird little fact. It's weird to you, but not to them. Um, what, something that we see happen every year. We have 10 winners, and frequently um, they'll come up to me afterward and say, the other nine things that you gave a prize to, they're so funny, but why did you give a prize to us? Yeah. And I'll give you a, an example that always sticks in my mind. We gave a prize about 20 years ago to a team of scientists in Australia. They had published a research paper called An Analysis of the Forces Required to Drag Sheep Across Various Surfaces. An Analysis of the Forces Required to Drag Sheep Across Various Surfaces. And the phone call where we offered them the prize, that was the first moment they realized that what they had done is funny. <laughs> They, because they live in a part of Australia where sheep is the big industry. Mm -hmm. And the industry had asked these scientists, come in, look at everything we do, tell us how we can make more money and cut down on injuries. So that's what they did. Amazing. And also, um, since you're listening, I, I've, I've been in many events with one of these scientists, and people in the audience always ask, what's the most important thing you discovered? And he, he always turns a little red, looks kind of sheepish. And he says, well, really, the most important thing we discovered is it's easier to drag a sheep downhill. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's, uh, that's, that is that was news to the industry. Yeah. They, they have all these buildings connected by ramps where they were dragging thousands of sheep okay. uphill until yeah. some scientists looked at it and said, hey. Someone's got to ask the question and find the answer. Natasha, what does it feel like to win one of these awards? Does it feel like an honor? Is it a dubious honor? How, what was your reaction? So first I was getting emails and I was like, I don't know if this is real because we get a lot of stuff like we get, you know, you win publish, you get a lot of. So I kept deleting them until I got a phone call from an important person, let's put it that way. And they're like, Natasha, this is real. You need to pay attention. So my colleagues have reacted two ways. I would say 90% are like super ecstatic and they think it's so funny. Like I got a thing today that like, I knew you were funny, but I didn't know you were that funny. But I'm like, this is serious business. But 10% are like, really, Natasha, is this a good thing? And I'm like, you know what? Life is one. What we do brings us joy. We change lives, whether it's one hair at a time or not. So I love it. I love the whole experience. I love the attention is brought to the students who are now young doctors, like, they're so excited. So to see the team being all into it, man, we, take, we I don't know. It's just been super, super positive. That's great. That's great. Mark, some of the other things that one is, you're just going down the list here. There's a, a really uh, impressive, I mentioned it earlier, smart 
toilet uh, that uh, does defecation analysis uh, and a bunch of other things that I'm not even going to mention here. Um, that that one was um, was pretty obvious, uh, I think. For yeah, it's known as the Stanford toilet. It was invented at Stanford University, and it's um, the inventor is very torn because it might help quickly identify diseases people have before they realize. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's a camera inside a toilet. So there are some real privacy issues yeah. that uh, yeah. no, for need sure. working out. Yeah. And uh, the answer to why scientists like to lick rocks was surprising to me. I assumed it had something to do with taste, but it does not. Well, it might. The main thing is when a scientist is out there and finds some rock that might be interesting, they want to look at it. So usually they'll get a little magnifying glass mm -hmm. or something, but Sometimes it's hard to see the details if it's dry, but if it's wet, if it's wet the details sort of pop out. So if you lick it, that's the quick and easy way, and suddenly you can understand a lot more. Also, once geologists, and it's geologists, the people who study rocks who become good at this, but once they start doing this, many of them develop the ability to identify what kind of material, what kind of rock is this by the taste. All right, so, so there is taste in there as well. Oh, yeah. We, we have just a moment and, and, left. And some of them just enjoy it. Yeah, it's, you know, of course, naturally. Yeah. You would. Uh, we have just a moment left. Are there any others uh, that, over the years that you've been doing this, that, uh, that you particularly like, that come to mind uh, yeah, I'll favorites? Show, I'll show you quickly one, and I'll mention the whole list is at improbable.com. And also, all, most of the new winners are coming here to MIT in November to talk to each other. Okay. This is the emergency bra. The emergency bra. This was invented by a doctor who had treated patients at the Chernobyl power plant meltdown. And it quickly separates into a pair of protective face masks. One to protect you, yep. and one to perhaps save the life of, some of somebody lucky else. bystander. It's got all kinds of engineering, so just, you just can put, have your hands yep. free and find a safe place to get to. Amazing. And, and she even made a business of it. Okay. Great, the emergency yeah, these, these bra. Are for children. Who, one bra, two masks, be safe, yeah. be sexy. Yep. I love it. All right, great. Uh, and so this, you were, you were remote again this year. You're hoping to, to be back in, in person next year? I hope so. Usually we have it at Sanders Theater in Harvard, filled with 1,200 people in the audience. We always have a bunch of Nobel Prize winners there handing out the prizes. We had 10 of them this year. And people throw paper airplanes. That was something the audience invented, and we keep doing it. And yeah. it's a circus. Well, the, the video that came out that you put out just last week is a ton of fun to watch, and, and people can find it online. Um, uh, Mark Abrams and Natasha Messenskova, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. I'm Craig Lamont. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.